स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया टुडे वी शैल टॉक अबाउट मुगल आर्किटेक्चर लुक एट हू द मुगल्स वर वट दे बिल्ड एंड हैव दियर आर्किटेक्चर चेंज थ्रू टाइम what kinds of influences did they bring from their homelands in the fargana valley and what kind of elements did they pick up in india where we have a very different tradition of architecture uh, who are the moguls anyway and what is the extent of their rule here we see that the moguls over a period of 150 years expanded to cover most of south asia they started off by invading delhi got beaten back recovered delhi in the 1550s under humayun and from there on till the death of aurangzeb there was no looking back they with every successive emperor conquered more and more lands after the death of aurangzeb in 1707 the mughal empire starts fragmenting and by the end of the mughal era in 1858 when the last mughal emperor bahadur shah zafar is sent off to burma there is very little expansion in fact you have a contraction of the kingdom therefore five mughal emperors who are thought of as the great mughal emperors humayun akbar jahangir shah jahan and aurangzeb and it is in the reign of these five emperors that we find most construction in the mughal emperor we shall start with babur the first of the mughal emperors thought of as the founder of the dynasty who came from his homeland in the fargana valley he was driven out by his cousins he was a direct descendant of both changiz khan and timur who had invaded india a century before babur came to india through afghanistan where we find some of the constructions that he undertook most notably the bage babur babur built the bage babur a garden outside of kabul it is interesting for historians of architecture in india because it has a plan that would later be called a char bagh plan a quadripartite arrangement what is not evident in this picture so much is the sloping terrain on which this garden is from one side to the other is a very heavy gradient which allows water to flow through naturally the quadripartite arrangement is separated by a number of water channels which irrigates the garden trees of various colors and heights would have been planted in various sectors of this garden so that once you sat in the pavilion right on top you would see the garden laid out like a carpet below you with different colors the heights of the trees would be arranged in a way that they might appear to be at the same level from the top this kind of planning would be seen in later gardens that the moguls built in india for almost 2 to 300 years in fact this garden came to be called a mughal garden in colonial times babur's garden has a central water channel that goes down using the force of gravity another feature that most mughal gardens in india would use the grave of babur himself is very simple open to the sky in conformance with traditional orthodox beliefs about how a grave should be the garden was very badly destroyed in the civil war that afghanistan suffered in the 90s and 2000s and has recently been completely restored while it is not in india itself it is an important precedent for things that will follow babur's descendants in india we know from later paintings of the ways in which emperors and rulers personally supervise the laying out of gardens Here is a manuscript produced under Akbar in which Babur is shown supervising the garden that he laid out. You can see various kinds of people at work including gardeners and masons. We also know of a number of very important treatises like the Irshad ul Zira which were written in Afghanistan by hereditary families of gardeners and by gardeners we don't mean people who just do menial gardening but also people who actually were men of letters they were writing treatises on how to breed good plants on what good gardening means on the role of gardening in governance such people were often at the mughal court 
and they were entrusted with laying out and maintaining gardens of various kinds. Babar also built in Dholpur a small pool called the house in Ilufar or the pool of lotuses carved in the yellow Dholpur rock. Not much of it survives and certainly nothing of the gardens that were laid around it. Babar dies and is succeeded by his son Humayun who comes to power and manages to lose his kingdom to an important general called Sher Shah Suri only to get it back from Sher Shah Suri in 1553. Humayun does not have a rich architectural legacy because a lot of his life was spent running away from the forces of Sher Shah, finding refuge in Iran and trying to regain his kingdom. Yet outside of Agra, we do see small monuments and mosques like this one. But again, there is nothing to distinguish this as being from Humayun's reign or indeed Mughal for that matter. But please do note that the central arch of this mosque is raised. It is a large opening, something that they derive from Timurid architecture. There are a number of tombs from Humayun's reign, which you find in Delhi. These tombs are largely unknown in terms of who their inhabitants were, but they are given local monikers like uh, Nila Gumbas and Subs Burs, which is to say Blue Dome and Green Dome. What is interesting about them is that they follow a completely Timurid plan, and we shall look at what a Timurid plan for tombs in this period is. Notice that portals on four of the sides are much taller and larger than the ones in the middle which are smaller. These four portals which are larger in size would be called Ivans and they become an important feature of Mughal architecture as well. Here is the other dome which you have in Delhi that is attributed to this period though its inhabitant is completely unknown. Humayun's tomb is also marked by his occupation of a fort in Delhi called the Purana Kila or the Old Fort. Largely out of red sandstone, it contains a number of buildings within, some of which date back from a sultanate period before the Mughals. However, some buildings like this, called the Sher Mandal, might be attributed either to Humayun or to Sher Shah. We are unsure of who built them, but this building, an octagonal two-storied pavilion, is attributed to Humayun and it is believed that this was his royal library from where he suffered a fall, fell down the stairs and died only to have his son Akbar succeed him. Akbar becomes one of the greatest emperors of the Mughal dynasty that India has known. Akbar grows up in a completely multicultural environment. He has a number of Turkish advisors. He has relationships with uh, the Rajputs whom he subdues, conquers and even marries into. He has a completely syncretistic understanding of what the state and religion should be and most importantly he patronizes architecture on a massive scale absorbing a lot of new influences that he's being subject to as he conquers lands in western and central india his father humayun who never built a tomb for himself finds his grave in a tomb built by his son akbar akbar has this constructed in the 1570s as a marker of his own monumentality, while ostensibly it is a memorial to his father, it actually proclaims Akbar's greatness as an emperor. This mode in which Mughal emperors will use grand buildings in honor of somebody else uh, to mark their own reign is notable. We shall see several mausolea like this, notably the Taj which was built by Shah Jahan for his wife, but again gets associated with the name of Shah Jahan himself. And similarly, the last of the great Mughal emperors, Aurangzeb, builds his wife, or at least commissions for his wife, a great mausoleum called Bibi Ka Makbara in Aurangabad. That mausoleum too is built for his wife, but it is Aurangzeb and his son whose names are remembered because of its construction. This also is the tomb that will form the template for what Mughal tombs become. Four Ivans, these four grand openings on four sides, four corners of rooms and then a dome on top. This kind of plan 
is often referred to as a hushed behisht plan where you have four rooms in four corners four portals in the centers and then a space enclosed in the middle hushed behisht literally translates as eight paradises and there are a number of buildings in isfahan and shiraz that use this kind of planning principle humayun's tomb is also set on an enormous platform of great height in the middle of what we saw earlier in babar's garden an arrangement of channels that divide the garden into many quarters this large basement story on which the monument is kept almost like a pedestal is used to keep an object on it is a very important feature of monumental mughal architecture and this is a plan of the garden and here you clearly see the kind of garden arrangement that becomes associated exclusively with the mughals or the post mughals that is to say dynasties who succeed the mughals akbar also builds himself a number of palaces in places that he takes over this is in the city of ajmer now a city museum but known as the palace of akbar built again in the 1580s as he takes over ajmer a large gateway with these kiosks or chhatris on top those small pavilions which are on balconies here not a very elegant solution but something that will be perfected through time these chhatris again will become a hallmark of mughal architecture inside the palace follows the same plan we've seen the hushed behisht plan which is to say there are blocks of rooms in the four corners of the buildings and in the middle of each facade is an entry way that leads straight into a central space note again there are no domes on top of this building because the construction here is what is called trebiated it is post and lintel it does not have arches this is borrowing from a local idiom of construction that is popular in gujarat and rajasthan in an earlier period this kind of constructional detail where you have an opening trisected into three openings is actually it has structural antecedents and we'll talk about it at some other time when we talk of other kinds of architecture the decorative schemes come straight out of gujarat and rajasthan the geometric decoration that you have on the left hand side is coming again out of a palette that is completely timurid what akbar also builds is the agra fort though the agra fort is added to a lot by his son jahangir and his grandson shah jahan in years to come but the stone decoration that akbar employs is something that is borrowing completely on an indigenous style of decoration while the patterns are geometric and use fractals like you have in islamic art the tradition of stone carving of this sophistication is really something that is completely indian Akbar is also best known for a city that he builds for himself called Fatehpur Sikri not very far away from Agra a city that has to be completely abandoned because of the shortage of water Fatehpur Sikri is celebrated as a city which has elements of very dense urban planning buildings interacting with each other through a set of courts and courtyards enclosure walls and an organization in which you have public areas and royal areas much like you have in other mogul forts the entrance to the city is grand but if you look at it from the inside you realize that the outside is far grander than the inside the inside is actually of well relatively modest proportions as compared to the outside which is this large ivan portal with a series of chhatris on top a number of buildings in fatehpur sikri are not understood in terms of their function because they have been given names later this particular building its use is unknown but what we we do see architecturally is that elements of this building come straight from the lands of rajasthan gujarat and central india where akbar had made conquests in the years just before this fatehpur sikri while built in the 1580s comes after akbar's invasions and conquests of these lands and artisanal traditions and design ideas from these areas find their way into what he thought would be his masterpiece fatehpur sikri therefore has these big heavy ornate brackets 
that support balconies, heavy cornice lines and also a profusion of chhatris on top of buildings. Inside this building which is thought of as an audience hall where Akbar sat in the middle of this column listening to people having debates at the bottom, you have again this kind of heavy bracketing that one finds in Gujarat. Ebba Koch, the Mughal historian has written extensively about how traditions in Gujarat shaped Mughal architectural form. A number of palaces and pavilions in Fatehpur Sikri again resemble buildings from lands that Akbar had conquered. The great entrance to Fatehpur Sikri is called the Buland Darwaza. A massive flight of stairs takes one up to this grand portal through which the city can be entered. In fact, not just the city, but the great mosque behind, which is one of the first mosques that Akbar builds. This Buland Darwaza will eventually be a form of inspiration for the great Jama Mosque in Delhi that Akbar's grandson Shah Jahan will build. Similarly mounted by a great flight of stairs, the doorway itself is imposing and conditions people to come in very humbly. Inside the mosque that is built at Fatehpur Sikri, the Jama Masjid, you see this element of Timurid architecture, the big portal, which even if there is a dome behind, always conceals the dome. You have a great grand facade with a whole succession of chhatris on top, a big courtyard in front, all of it done in the material that is favoured by Akbar, red sandstone, with marble used only for accents, for trimmings and for decoration. But in this complex is also another building done completely in white marble, perhaps inspired by the mausoleum of Hoshang Shah at Mandu, which is also done in white marble. This building borrows a planning principle from tombs in Gujarat, which have a central dome surrounded by an ambulatory passage and the whole of which is covered by screens on the sides or jalis on the sides. This white monumental tomb in the middle of a red sandstone setting makes it stand out. The saint Salim Chishti not only exemplifies what would be a very tight association between Chishti saints and the Mughal emperors, but also was the emperor because of which Akbar begat children including his son Salim who was named after the saint. In Fatehpur Sikri you also have a very unusual tower which is called the Hiran Minar, Hiran meaning deer and Minar meaning tower. There exist other towers like this in Mughal capitals, notably one in Lahore called uh, the Hiran Minar as well at a place uh, just outside of Lahore in Shekhupura. You also have similar towers built around the same time in the Sultanate of Bengal which is not yet under Mughal rule. Variously at Pandua and uh, at a place close to Gaud, those minarets too are small squat towers with a number of stone projections that resemble animal horns on the outside. While the use of these towers is unclear, it is believed that they were used to display various kinds of trophies that were hung on it, including hunted animals. Akbar also builds for himself a great mausoleum that is eventually finished by his son, his tomb at a place called Sikandara. This tomb is entered through a magnificent doorway which again is built in red sandstone with marble decoration and has four marble minarets on top. Akbar's own tomb at Sikandara is a multi-tiered building in which the top story is built completely in marble. Built of the same sandstone that most of the buildings in this period are, there are marble decorations but it is really the top story that makes it stand out almost like the marble rising through a morass of red sandstone at the bottom. There is no monumental dome that covers this. This does not follow the planning prescriptions of the Hasht Behisht 
plan from Iran. This really is an indigenous building with most of the construction being post and lintel, which is to say trabeated with very few domes, a profusion of chhatris which are such an Indian element at this point and a set of pavilions like what would be called Baradaris later completely covering the whole area of the monument. The decorative patterns though are completely out of an Islamic copybook. The roof on top is a precursor to what would become known as the Bangla roof particularly under Shah Jahan. But here it is just a vault over a longitudinal set of bays. The marble decoration is of a very fine high order but it is not just these two colors that make up all the decoration. There were colored tiles in this area but inside you had luster wear and paint covering most of the vaults. What is inside the mausoleum is completely reminiscent of designs that will be seen in Iran around the same time but even better under the Safavids a little later. The vaulting in Akbar's tomb is completely of Timurid origin and we do not see details like this a hundred years later. It is Akbar's son Jahangir who is famous as a big naturalist, as somebody who likes to observe things, as somebody who was very curious about the world that a number of important buildings in the Mughal period are attributed. Here we have a picture of Jahangir receiving his son at court. Notice that the court setting has a number of railings that separate people from courtiers and a number of elevations that, support, that separate the emperor from his own court. These barriers of intimacy or distance, these railings of different colors, a hierarchy of heights were very important in all the court buildings of the Mughals. The Mughals also develop a convention in this period that the emperors will never be depicted in any other view except a profile view. Whereas everybody else of lesser rank can be depicted in other ways. But the point of looking at paintings like this is to notice that buildings that we study now are mostly naked buildings bereft of carpets and curtains and fabrics and furniture and all kinds of other paraphernalia that would have adorned them. Jahangir builds a number of buildings including a mausoleum for his father-in-law, the father of Nur Jahan, Itamadud Dola, also at Agra. You do see a typical Mughal predilection for a building that is cross-axially symmetrical, which is to say all four facades of the building look the same. Jahangir also expands the red fort at Agra, building large portions of it. He introduces gateways and builds himself a set of gardens in Kashmir, which he is enamored with, making trips there throughout his reign. In Kashmir, he builds sets of gardens, much like the Bage Babur, the gardens of his great grandfather, which have cascades and flowing water coming down slopes with a central pavilion where one can sit and enjoy the trees and the sound of water with the sight of mountains in the background. The pavilions in, in Kashmir are completely different architecturally, choosing to employ local architectural traditions being built largely in wood. Under Jahangir's reign, you also have a set of tombs, very innovative, being built at a site called Khusrobag, which is also in Agra. These tombs, in many ways, will be precursors to what eventually becomes the Taj, particularly this, this one, uh, which is that dedicated to Nisar Begum. You find innovation of various kinds in these tombs, and it is possibly these small-scale tombs of lesser nobles and of the royal family that served as experimental models to design and conceive of grand tombs that the Mughals would be known for. The fashion of the octagonal tomb seems to be on the decline at this point, though we do have some which are still octagonal. Jahangir also builds a building which is now known as Kanch Mahal on account of the lavish ceramic and glass decoration that it used to have. This mode of decoration in which you have a special chamber 
that is only meant to be completely ornamented by ceramic tiles and by mirrors and glass is something that most post Mughal or contemporary states will pick up on. So, you will have similar palaces being built by the Rajputs in Rajasthan and also by the Marathas in the 18th century in Maharashtra. Lesser states who were feudatories to the Mughals like that of Orcha also emulate the great Mughal style from this period on. Orcha was ruled by a king who was a vassal of Jahangir and he built himself a grand palace. There is a story which probably is not true that the king of Orcha built this palace so that Jahangir could spend a night here and Jahangir spent a night there and that was it, it was never occupied thereafter. But disbelieving all such stories, what cannot be denied is that the planning principles of palaces by feudatory states in this period follows the imperial Mughal pattern. Gateways, courtyards, columns, openings, chhatris are all hallmarks of this planning which you will find throughout North India in the reign of Jahangir. It is impossible to tell if a building is Mughal or Rajput in this period because architecture does not know dynastic differences. A lot of paintings are also to be found in these palaces though in very poor shape. Probably the most celebrated builder of the Mughal dynasty was the Emperor Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan is known for a number of commissions and also known to have created a style that will become the Mughal style thereafter. But initially when he is posted as a prince in Sindh in his reign there that he, this building gets built, this mosque at Tharta. This follows a completely different idiom unlike any other Mughal building because it is looking westwards towards Iran for its crafts traditions and its design logic. But what Shah Jahan will build that will become an emblem of the Republic of India is the Red Fort in Delhi. North of where the Purana Kela was, he built himself an entire city called Shah Jahanabad with the Red Fort on the eastern side against the Yamuna River. He also builds in the middle of the city a grand mosque called the Jama Masjid. The citadel which is against the Yamuna is today called the Red Fort whereas the rest of the city of Shah Jahanabad is recognized as Old Delhi. Many of the areas in Delhi today still bear the names of the various gates of this walled city built by Shah Jahan. Here is another map of the city of Delhi with uh, the Red Fort now to the bottom because east in this map is shown at the bottom. The plan of the Red Fort in Delhi is not dissimilar from the plan of the Agra Fort which also is set against the Yamuna river on its eastern side. So you have a large part of the citadel or the fort facing the town and one side the eastern side faces the river which gives it natural defense but also an easy exit. Mm -hmm.